Well, good We're morning, Justin. everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. So welcome to the second episode of Wildland. Can you hear me? Sorry. Okay. Got nervous there for a second. <laughs> Welcome to the second episode of Wildland Stories. My name is Gabrielle Hardin, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Darren McAvoy. Our guest today is Dr. Justin DeRose. He's an assistant professor in silviculture and forest ecology here at Utah State University. He got his master's in silviculture from, oh, I'm sorry, his master's in forestry from University of Maine and his PhD in ecology here at Utah State University. His primary research program is focused on partitioning effects of stand dynamics, species co competition, and climate on growth variability measured in tree rings for the forest types common in Utah. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, I just wanna give you a brief overview of what today is gonna to look like. So this series aims to introduce people to the various fields and natural resources, and also introduce them to the wonderful professionals who work in these fields. For the first half of the interview, Darren and I kind of go over some basic questions with, with our guest today, it's Justin, and give you a feel of what the topic is. So today we're gonna learn about dendrochronology, which is super fascinating. Following that, we'll do a little bit of a rapid fire session, which is us just throwing the questions at Justin, all of the questions that you guys submitted. Near the end, we're gonna do a little bit of a QA and a portion for any questions that you guys had come up during the webinar. I ask that you please put those questions in the Q&A box and not in the chat box. It makes it a lot easier for us to find the questions. Okay, so enough logistics, that's super boring. Justin, if you have anything that you would like to say, um, feel free right now. If not, I'll hand it over to Darren for the first question. Let's go. Good morning, Justin. Good morning, Gabrielle. Thank you for hosting and setting us up today and appreciate everybody participating. I'm Darren McAvoy, Extension Assistant Professor here at Utah State University. And Justin is one of our uh, newer faculty members. We're honored to have him uh, with us today. We appreciate his uh, participation. And Justin is a silviculturist, uh, is his main focus with us, but his focus within that is dendrochronology. And Justin, can you tell us what is dendrochronology? Sure, thanks, Darren. Thanks for the introduction, Gabrielle. Um, I want to make sure everyone can hear me okay, so please pipe up if you can't. Yes. Uh, dendrochronology uh, is the study of time through the use of tree rings. So the word dendrochronology has Greek roots. Dendro means tree, uh, chrono is time, and of course, ology is the study of. Awesome. So would you call yourself a dendrochronologist? Yes, um, absolutely. Um, Dendrochronology uh, as a science is one of the many hats that I wear. And what does a dendrochronologist do? So that's where the floodgates really open. Um, there are many, many fields, many, uh, many avenues of inquiry that you can pursue to understand things about our past through the use of tree rings things such as climate, stand history, um, hydrogeomorphic history. Uh, there's actually- Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. hydro, what? <laughs> That's a big oh, word. <laughs> roll that one by, by us again, what's that mean? So if you wanted to say, understand the dynamics of a changing riverscape, the dynamics of a changing forest, um, what climate was like hundreds or thousands of years ago, one of the tools to do any of those things is to examine the rings of a tree. And how could a tree ring tell you what a river was doing or something 300 years ago? How, how does that work? Well, most trees, in particular in temperate regions, so not close to the equator, but close to the poles, form annual growth rings. It's a biological artifact of millions of years of evolution. <clears throat> and it happens in a very predictable manner. The formation of these tree rings on an annual or a seasonal basis allow us to um, get some verification about the calendar year when those tree rings were formed uh, um, and thus allowing us to look back in time. So how did you get into this field of study? Were you always just super passionate about trees and fascinated in the history that they tell? Well, 
Um, my earliest passion was really for forests and forestry. And over the course of my education in the field of forestry, um, of course, lots of the people on this call are probably foresters and you've used an increment bore, which we'll introduce in a minute, to core trees, maybe count the rings uh, in a forested plot. And I did that as well as a forester, but it, during my master's, I started to look at other details in the tree ring, um, not just growth rate, but things like sapwood and the age of the tree. Uh, and it wasn't until I started my PhD program with Dr. Jim Long, and we started reconstructing the history of forests. So, you know, where they came from, when we started to employ uh, cross-stating. And cross-stating is what differentiates what we do as foresters when we count the age of a tree, which doesn't have temporal control versus whether we know for sure the calendar year that a ring was formed. What, what do you mean doesn't have temporal control? What does that mean? I'm glad you asked that because I think you know what we need to clarify here is that uh, what when we when we pull a core from a tree in a forestry context, we're not doing dendrochronology. We might come up with a, a somewhat conservative estimate of the age of the tree. Um, but we don't know from year to year whether those rings that we see with our naked eye were actually formed in the year that we count back. In order to do that, we need to do something called cross-stating. Cross-stating is, in my opinion, the most important principle of the study of dendrochronology. Uh, and, and the definition of cross-stating is that we take multiple samples from multiple individuals covering perhaps multiple periods of times and we pattern match the ring, the variability in those ring widths um, to come up with precise, uh, what I mean by temporal control is that we know with 100% certainty after cross-stating which calendar year each tree ring was laid down. Hmm. Wow, so, that's pretty incredible. So if there was a drought 300 years ago, you, you can see that? So that question, the general question, answer to that question is yes. Um, the nuanced answer is you have to be careful, and this gets into um, the fields of dendrochronology, if you were looking for a drought 300 years ago, you would need to select a particular type of tree, possibly on a particular site, um, to determine that. And a note for the people on the, on the, um, webinar today, I just added a link into the chat box. I think every, can everyone see that? Yes. Yeah. If you're interested in seeing a visual description of how cross-stating works, please visit that link. So you had mentioned a little bit ago something about an increment bore and a core, like a core from a tree. So what? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So we needed to clarify some of the tools. Now, I know lots of people have seen these before. Um, uh, but the most common way of getting that tree ring data out of the tree in a non-destructive way, so without cutting down the tree, uh, like you see on a tree stump, is using something called an increment bore. And an increment bore, I have one here, hopefully you can see it. It's essentially a three-piece tool. It has a spoon, I'm, I'm unscrewing it here. And that flagging is just so I don't lose it when I'm in the woods. It has a, what looks like a drill bit. And in fact, it is a drill bit, but it's hollow. And a handle that you insert the drill bit into. Once you have this and it's properly cared for and functioning, uh, which is important, you can then uh, pull a core from a living or a dead tree. Now, the, what comes out of that, in the field, we put into a straw to take back to the lab. But this is what it looks like. Now, um, as many of you know, you can pull a core out of a tree and count the age sometimes. Sometimes it's quite difficult. But what we need to do in the lab 
we need to process this before we can accurately measure the ring width. So what we'll do is we'll take this and we'll glue it onto a wooden mount. So it looks something like this, and appropriately label it. And then there is an appropriate process of, of sanding or cutting this to prepare it to view under a microscope or on a scanning bed. So I have kind of a silly question for you. Um, I've cored a lot of trees in my day and I've had a lot of trees shoot some water out at me. How many trees have peed on you? Oh man, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I wasn't anticipating that question, but now that you bring it up, <laughs> um, countless and uh, it varies by the species. So if you core a cottonwood, it might be tapped right into the water table. And so that liquid's very clear. I've cored very old Douglas fir and the liquid that came out was as, I must have hit a sap pocket or something like that. And the liquid that came out was as dark as pitch. And that was not a good day. <laughs> so you, you said sometimes it's harder than other times. Are some trees easier to core than others? Yeah, and there's a really a generality here. <clears throat> All trees, um, by the nature of their biology, are made up of wood on the inside. And wood is made up of some chemical and biological constituents, but there's a lot of empty space in their air. And, you know, for those of you that have had a basic chemistry class, we measure the density of wood using something called specific gravity. So, how dense is the wood compared to, uh, it's essentially what proportion of the wood is air. And so in a conifer, like you might see growing uh, on the Wasatch Front, about 33% of that wood is actually wood. The rest is oak air space. Uh, those juniper that you see, they're double. They're like 60%. Uh, those mahogany are about 80%. And so somewhere between 60 and 80, if you put it in, in a, on a water body, it's not going to float anymore. So, uh, and so the harder the wood, the harder they are to, to drive in an increment bore. So this sort of ties in with my work as, as a biomass coordinator here in Utah. And a lot of the challenge of making value out of the wood we have that's so far spread out in our large uh, state is that you can't afford to haul it because you're hauling 60% air. And there's no right. value to hauling air to a sawmill. And, and so, yeah, it ties it back in. It's interesting. That air, when you, when you cut down a live tree, that air space tends to be filled with a lot of moisture. And so it really increases the weight of the wood. The, the, the amount of moisture can also influence taking an increment core, depending on um, the time of the growing season. Is it spring? Is it the middle of winter when there might be some, some frozen parts of the outer stem? So when you take those core samples, is it causing the tree any harm? Is it opening up to possible health issues in the future, infestation problems? So um, I get this question a lot. I think most people are really concerned about what are we hurting the tree? And I think what I like to tell people is it's important to remember the tree, uh, the basic biology of the tree. Um, trees, the vast majority of the biomass in a tree is dead. In a, in a biological definition, it has no nucleus. The cells are dead, even though there are some functions like it's holding the tree up. It might be supporting water flow. Anything we call wood is dead. The only live part of the tree is the foliage, the roots, and then a really small sheath of, of, growth, of growth cells that grow on the outside just under the bark. And so that little increment bore that I showed you has a diameter of 4.5 millimeters. And so when I insert it in the bark, uh, I take a 4.5 millimeter diameter cross section through that phloem, that's live, and then into the wood, that's dead. Um, I've created, I've taken a tiny portion of live um, material from that tree and the rest is dead. Uh, there are insects, there are pattern, there are, there are um, things that happen to stands naturally, like branches breaking off, trees falling down into each other, all kinds of things that happen naturally that open up much larger wounds. So 
Of course, there's variability depending on the type of species, um, but these trees have all evolved to deal with this type of wounding. Um, in, and in addition to that question is that, that I, I always get is, after you pull the cord, do you plug the hole? And the answer is an unequivocal no. Um, what you wanna do is let that tree use its defense mechanisms um, to deal with that hole you've just created. Don't put something in there because what you've done is you've just trapped any bacteria or fungal spores that are in the air and they're everywhere, by the way, in there. Interesting, good to know. And I think it's also worth pointing out along, uh, generally speaking, foresters or even dendrochronologists are sampling a very small portion of the trees in the forest. So, yeah. I'm sure you'll ask me questions about cross sections at some point and that story might be different there. <laughs> yeah. So um, back to those tree rings, can a tree grow more than one ring per year or can they have no, no rings for a year? Also two of the most common questions I get about negrochronology. The answer to both of those questions is yes. And I'm gonna qualify that with both of those situations are incredibly rare. So the first of those, will a tree grow an extra ring in a year? The answer is yes, and the way we deal with that in dendrochronology, we have a name for those, we call them false rings because they can trick us. Uh, that's part of the reason why counting rings in the woods versus preparing the core and looking under a microscope um, really improves our cross-dating. Once we look at those under a microscope, uh, it's very um, uncommon for false rings to actually be that convincing. Now, False rings are formed only in areas where the climate um, acts in such a way that it provides the tree with uh, what looks like a second growing seedling. So a really good example of that is in the southwestern United States where a lot of moisture comes in the winter and, that, and it gets stored in the soil and it provides the moisture needed to begin growth the, fall, the subsequent growing season. Uh, but then before the monsoons come, there's a drought. So trees get the signal that it's time to stop growing. If the drought's strong enough, there's enough moisture delivery, they will continue to grow. So they'll start again anew as if uh, it was the beginning of the growing season before terminating their growth sometime in late summer or the fall. And that's how false rings are, are um, grown. Missing rings, on the other hand, are um, also incredibly rare, not only in tree rings in general, but globally. Um, but they are something that we deal with in the Western United States because it, we tend to have a strong seasonality. So wide variability in the amount of moisture that comes and in our seasons. What happens with a missing ring is that over the course of a growing season in an incredibly harsh year, the tree, remember I said there's that sheath of live material just under the bark, and that's what grows the wood each year. If the growing conditions are so harsh that the tree doesn't completely put on that sheath down the stem um, and you core in that area, you might core through an area where the tree never got around to building the ring in that year. Now you could core on the other side of the tree and it may have finished its growth on that side of the tree. So in dendrochronology, we call those locally missing rings because the way that we sample can influence whether we find missing rings or not. <clears throat> is, is there ways to age trees otherwise without coring into them or otherwise? Yeah, so there's two sort of uh, relatively simple ways to age trees. One is to use historic records. That's always a, it's always a good one. Save you a ton of time. Uh, but we haven't uh, been here forever. Uh, uh, so a, a pioneer journal, or explain that, how, how do you do that? Yes, right. I mean, so the last 100 years, uh, well, 120 years now, most of where we live in the West has been under federal land management. And so if there are records of planting, whether those trees were there before, R written records, we don't have, you know, if we have written records, we don't have to go through the effort of sampling 
the trees to then make an estimate of when we think they were there. The other biological way, which is kind of neat, is that a lot of trees, um, especially a lot of pine trees, when they finish growing in the growing season, they put on a bud. That's at the tip of the branches. And inside of that bud is the material that it's gonna use to grow in the next growing season. Um, that bud has a scar where it meets the stem. Next season, that bud will break. The leaf primordia, the, 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 the beginnings of leaf growth will come out and you'll get shoot elongation. Um, but where that bud was located, there's a scar. We call that a whorl. And some of you, I know mean, lots of you have been in young pine stands or young fir stands. Uh, and those whorls, those bud scars, they leave bud scars and you can count those up the stem. And I've done this with subalpine fir well over a hundred years. You can count those back in time. And that because we know how the tree grows, it's a reliable indicator of age without using dendrochronology. <laughs> So let's jump over to something that I know a lot of people are super fascinated about. Um, let's talk about climate and dendrochronology. Sure. How is climate being measured using dendrochronology? Um, how does it help us understand climate history? Uh, under the field of dendrochronology, there are, there's a, a large number of people, a pretty active line of research that we tend to call dendroclimatology. And in that field, um, what people are concerned with is largely is using tree rings and incredibly long records of tree rings to understand climate and climate variability. And um, in particular, to reconstruct climate variability far into the past, much farther than we have written records for. Can you, um do this sort of thing in other places? Like, does it work in the tropics? Um, the, the answer to that for a long time has been no. Um, but, but now that people are looking, uh, I have to say that there, there are many opportunities to date tree rings from the tropics. And, and I'll tell you why. Um, tropical areas or areas close to the equator tend to have growing seasons that um, can extend through most of the year and therefore obscuring that the growth pattern that we see in temperate trees where there's um, clear rings start and stop to growth, which is what creates the rings that we see. And um, what people have found is that there are tropical trees that appear to be growing continuously all year long every year. But if as soon as you move into um, niches, so maybe a slightly different aspect, a slightly different elevation, a different side of a mountain range, east side versus west side, where there is some seasonality to the growth of the tree. So the trees in any year might experience something like a few months where they don't get moisture and that kind of like our pre-monsoon drought. Um, and this happens mostly, uh, a lot of conifers we're finding even in the tropics we can find uh, that ring width formation due to those, that seasonal variability. Now, to determine that, we need to sample a whole bunch of them and match those. So we'll get back to cross-dating again. And it always helps to have at least a few decades of climate records to compare with the tree rings because that's where the, the foundation of the relationship between the tree rings and the climate data come from. Hmm. So. You, you talked about rebuilding climate with tree rings. What about, how can you rebuild a, um, or reconstruct an insect outbreak or is that possible? Um, regardless of the reconstruction, whether it's climate, insect, outbre insect outbreaks, um, rock fall, the age of a stand, um, the reconstruction involves carefully designing a study that you select trees that are likely to record the item of interest that you're interested in. So any one tree that you go and pick up on the hillside isn't gonna do all of those things I just talked about. You need to be familiar with the literature obviously and when you're performing science and you need to pick those trees specifically. So I think to carry on the, the 
well, I'll answer your, your beetle question. Understanding a beetle outbreak might involve picking trees that get attacked by the beetle, but don't get killed by the beetle because those trees will die and go away and we'll lose that, that information. Um, if you're there not long after the beetle, you know those trees are dead and you know they were killed by say a spruce beetle, but they're still standing. We can take a core and we can determine what the last year of growth was on that tree using cross dating. And I've done this, uh, this is makes up a large portion of my research program in the West. We have a lot of dead trees and we've been able to date the exact year that they died through this approach. Now, there are, there's also other, uh, I mean, there are just a whole host of methodologies we can use for reconstruction. There's other nuance. And so you can core a tree and also core its neighbor um, and look for patterns in what we call growth release. So um, maybe one tree died and its neighbor didn't because it's a different species. And once that tree died, we know the open growing space was opened up. And so that tree started to grow larger rings because there was more resources available. So there's lots of ways that we can indirectly infer things like this, a, a spruce beetle or a bark beetle outbreak. So earlier you had mentioned the cross section of a tree. Can we talk about what that is a little bit and how often are you cutting trees down to, to see those? And yeah, um, I actually have a, a picture of a, of a half of a cross section. Am I able to share my screen? Yes, you should be able to, no problem. Okay, let me see if I can open this here. Okay, this is a picture of half of a cross section because it's not that's showing. what I had in the lab. Can you see that? No, you'll have to move it around a little bit or select a different screen to share. Hmm, let's see, let me try this. See your uh, list, your file list. Yep, oh, there, it yeah, is. I, there we go. I shared my, my files, not the picture that's in the files. There we go. <laughs> Okay, so this is a cross section of a Douglas fir that was in my lab when I got here a couple of years ago. I, so I don't know where it came from, but we did, we're pretty sure it came from somewhere in Logan Canyon. Now I've labeled some things on it because I use this for educational purposes, but I, I try to keep it out. Douglas fir, there's a lot of things about Douglas fir that are very instructive. Um, the first of which, to answer your question, is this is a cross section. So whatever this was taken for, um, the tree was what we call destructively sampled. So that tree was measured, but of course we had to either cut it down or cut part of it off in order to do the, the measuring. And we do a lot of that in dendrochronology. I'm sure there'll be some more questions about that. One thing I should mention is that this is probably a good opportunity to mention to people, if you haven't seen what we call a tree ring, in close, close up, um, the ring itself isn't just that dark band. So that's what you count when you're in the field. That's what you, when you show elementary school children increment cores and say, here's the tree rings, which I do all the time for educational activities, or at least I did before COVID. Um, you count the rings, it's easy. But there's the, devil, the, the devil's in the details here. The ring is actually the combination of that light band and that dark band. That's what makes up the annual growth. And there's a biological reason for that. Um, at the crisp edge of the dark and light band, as the tree is growing outwards, which is the direction that they grow, um, early in the growing season, they put on, in this case, it's a conifer, so it's a xylem cell. It's like a pipe. There's a whole bunch of pipes there. And we've cut off a cross-sectional view of them. They put them on their big with thin walls so they could flow water and grow fast. Over the course of the growing season, the cell walls thicken and that's what gives you that darkened color. And at some point late in the summer, they get the cue to stop growing and then they put on this final wall of thick, of thick wall cells, parenchyma they're called in biological terms, and they're done growing for that year. So in any given tree, the ring width growth might actually occur over maybe three or four or five months of the year. The rest of the year, the tree isn't doing uh, any ring, any growth of wood. It's just sitting there waiting for the next growing season. 
So it looks like kind of in the middle, um, it looks like there could be something that could be a scar. Um, do trees get scars? What causes that to happen? Uh, can you see me moving my cursor? Yes. Okay, so I'm circling an area that's a scar. Lots of things cause scars. And I'm sure there were questions about tree scars. Um, uh, if those of you that were on the webinar last month, Dr. Larissa Yocum talked a lot about fire ecology and a little bit about the use of dendrochronology and dating fire scars so a fire can cause a scar. The, the way that happens, the reason the tree is scarred is that when the tree, you can imagine where that scar was, the tree would have had a layer of bark and would have been just that size, that size in diameter. And something happened to the bark to cause the secondary, that growth material that's just inside the bark to be damaged or to die. Um, that could be a, a, the heat from a fire does that. And if the heat isn't too strong to kill the, the phloem all the way around, which would kill the tree, but just kills part of it, it will create a scar. Um, scars are created by lots of things. A, a, Rock fall, so a rock smashing into the foam of the tree can cause a scar. Um, a spruce beetle that's um, foraging in the bark, trying to check if this is a good tree, but takes off and decides it's not, that can cause a little scar. A branch falling, breaking off of a tree and peeling some bark with it, which happens as, as trees grow up, they, sometimes they receive their branches, that can cause a scar. Um, if you drive a tractor through a harvest operation and you accidentally drag a log against the edge of a tree, that can cause a scar. Uh, there are lots of ways to, um, to damage a tree. Um, and one of the tricks, one of the things that we do as dendrochronologists is try to determine what caused those scars. So when the tree rings are growing very close together, does that could one assume that maybe the tree was under stress and it didn't grow as much that year? That's a general assumption when we're looking at ring widths. So just inside of that scar, you can see there's at least a decade of very low growth. And <clears throat> because this came out of Logan Canyon and the tree itself dates to sometime in the mid 19th century, um, we think, I mean, I would presume that this, this particular tree was growing in a forest of almost all um, other Douglas fir and all the same age. So as they grow together like that, their canopies come together and they start to compete with each other for resources. And so this competition decreases their ring width. Uh, it's a very sort of, um, sort of a classical um, pattern of growth in these even age stands. At some point, something happened. This tree, probably a neighbor or two of this tree died, opened up growing space, and you see that it started to grow well again for quite a while. Um, but it does decrease in growth again, all right, over the course of its life. You can see that the rings start to get smaller again. So back to the scar, can you tell what made that particular scar, if it was from logging or another tree falling on it or something? So that one's tough. Um, I, I think because of where this cross section was taken, this cross section is from up, far enough up the stem that it probably wasn't a fire scar and those tend to be near the ground. So I would rule that one out. Also, we could look with a microscope really close to see if there's any charcoal. Uh, it could have been a, at that time, there could have been something like a porcupine mining on the bark. Um, my guess so, my guess is what you see a lot in even age stands is that Every year, there are some trees that lose the competition for resources and they die, and those trees eventually fall over. And so trees falling over and just sliding down the side of the adjacent trees, which, which does damage the bark. I mean, you foresters have seen that in the woods. That's what that kind of scar looks like. That would be my guess. So you can, there's not a direct, uh, indication, but you can use inference if you're familiar with the stand, if it had an avalanche or a logging or some other activity that could cause, or fire that could cause the scarring, huh? Yes. Sometimes it's indirect. Sometimes it's direct. 
if you'll give me a minute here, I'll show you another picture of a type of scar. Um, it's actually a formation of a different type of cell that's in response to a specific disturbance. So while you're pulling that up, um, will you just answer me a quick question? If you could study any forested region in the world, where would you choose? Okay, if I could choose any region in the world, I would choose, um, I, I like the region where we are, temperate forests, and, and I'll tell you why. Um, I like coniferous trees. They're not as diverse as all the other trees, tree species, but they contribute disproportionately to forest biomass and forest functioning in the world. Um, the other reason I like temperate forest systems is because um, of all the globe, those forests uh, grow the most biomass. They have the most leaf area. Tropical forests are way more wet, but our forests are much more productive. Um, so have you- Dark, deep forests. Have you been able to visit uh, any of these exotic forest types? Do you have a favorite that you've visited in the past? Well, I don't know. I think maybe the Sitka, Sitka spruce forests on the Olympic Peninsula, the deepest, darkest uh, forests in the world, the highest leaf areas um, in the world. Pretty cool. Not quite exotic, but, but it is exotic in the sense that it's incredibly rare. I agree. I think that is exotic. I mean, yeah, for a lot of people in the world, it would be. Did you want to show us a picture? Yeah, can you see that picture? Is it properly shared? No, you, no. Have, to, you have to share your screen still. Let me try this again. Do the screen share and share that. Okay. And then when you get it up uh, on screen, tell us, oh, that's a very different uh, photo. <laughs> go, ahead, go ahead, Justin. Okay, what you're looking at here is a close up of an increment core of an Engelmann spruce. In fact, I didn't realize this the resolution was so good here, but some of you might be able to see the roundness of the individual cells and the linear features of their growth uh, from this tree is growing from right to left. So each ring to the left is one subsequent year later. And for this particular tree, it starts off early in the growing season. I'll put my mark. I'll put my cursor on it. That's the. That's since this is Engelmann spruce. This is probably happening in May or June, since they're high in elevation and there's growth doesn't xylogenesis or the growth of wood doesn't start till later in the growing season, and it puts on large cells. And the way cell formation works is it creates these linear paths of cells, and then at some point later in the growing season. And these trees, temperature likely cues them to make a little bit thicker walls and that what creates that darker band. So where my cursor is now is the end of the growing season for that tree. We think probably July, sometime between July and August. So the reason I'm showing you this is that there's this band of large cells in there that look curious and we know what these are because we went in and sampled these trees a couple of years after a spruce beetle attack had occurred in the stand. And it didn't kill all the trees, but it definitely um, damaged a whole bunch of trees. And we cored these trees. And sure enough, the year that we saw spruce beetles in these stands uh, on this tree, this tree successfully, trees have mechanisms to resist disturbances like spruce beetles. So this tree's mechanism went into effect and it grew what are called resin ducts to rapidly flow pitch and pitch out those attacking beetles. And so when we see this feature in a tree like Engelmann spruce, which doesn't typically have resin ducts unless it's defending itself, we, we, we're fairly confident that that indicates that um, damage happened to the tree. We, because of the time of sampling and the design of the study, we know in this case, it was spruce beetle. Now I mentioned earlier that um, we can record things like rock fall, falling rocks or you know, damage to a tree. Oftentimes the response of the tree is to grow these resin ducts. 
And that's one of the one of the ways we know about those things is by looking at the tree rings and looking for these these abnormalities in growth. Can you pull up that former one? Do you still have that one available? We have a few questions about that. Um, sure. That scar. Uh, how do you tell how long ago that scar happened? How do you age where that scar happened? And somebody also asked. Uh, there was a a section below that scar that had much tighter rings than above or below. And is there any explanation for that? Yeah, we'll find them Not seeing it we, yet? I think we touched on that la the later question about the closed okay. row, um, but Maybe definitely the first the one. Canopy. Sorry, I got to reopen the picture here. Here we go. Um, and now let me share it. Okay, my description of the closing of the canopy and a competition for resources in the stand, that's what's, hap that's what's causing this. The, the general question about how do we know what year those were, oh, sorry, what year those were formed, um, what we would do in the lab, once this is prepped, is that we would make a measurement of those ring widths all the, from the pith all the way up to the bark, um, and we would do that for other trees, maybe in the same stand, maybe two times on that same cross section, so two radii, maybe uh, other stands nearby, and we would compare the variability in ring width, and that's part of how the cross stating process happens. When we take measurements of those ring widths, we can then statistically compare the variability in ring width with other samples. This is a type of replication when it comes to doing studies. And that's how we nail down the calendar year. So we're gonna try and jump into some rapid fire questions now, just so we can get, um, try and get to some of these questions that our lovely audience had submitted for us. Great. So try and keep it, if possible, keep it to like a one or two sentence answer. And we're just gonna try and get through some of these. So first one's pretty basic. Do limbs stay at the same height as trees grow? The answer to that is everyone should know, right? We're all foresters on the Forestry Extension podcast. The answer is yes, they stay at the same height. Very predictable. Many of our viewers are not foresters. Many of them are just people who are interested in learning. So that's why we get these kinds of questions. Good, now you've learned something. <laughs> are there labs that can provide dendrochronology services for a bee? The answer to that is yes uh, and my lab does that at Utah State, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention my primary colleague, Dr. Matt Becker at Brigham Young University, who also does, who's also an excellent dendrochronologist. Um, and then regionally, there are other, mostly universities, but a few private individuals that will do, um, will do the, the heavy lifting of the dendrochronology. Do you see a record of native people using a tree for food or medicine? Uh, the answer to that is yes, and it depends on which native people we're talking about and which species they used, but there are examples of those all over the West. Excuse me, let me jump in here and point to a Utah Forest News article from mm -hmm. oh, 15 or 16 years ago called Medicine Trees, where we, where we wrote about that going on in the Uinta Mountains and pine trees. Darren, we can't see your beautiful face. Oh, what happened oh there here? we go. There he is. I'm back. <laughs> did you get that question or comment? Yes. Yes, we did. Okay. Can tree rings provide any answers to mysteries such as why the crooked forest in Poland exists? I'm going to show everybody what this is too while you talk about that really quick. Yeah, I would say that's a good question. So the answer is yes. Yeah. And this is a good example of where you would save a lot of time by just looking at the written records because we know why those exist because of written records. But if you were to um, carefully take increment cores or cross sections from those trees, um, both in the portion that's bent and the portion next to the ground, we would be able to, through cross dating, determine what year those trees were, I think in this case, those trees were likely planted or regenerated silviculturally and uh, what year they were bent over by the practitioner who was trying to make um, 
uh, who was likely trying to grow curved pieces of wood for shipbuilding would be my guess is what's happening here. Oh, the reason so this was do done that, purposely. I think so. Yeah. The, uh, Interesting. the reason we could do that with dendrochronology is that because we know how wood formation happens in conifers. Uh, so in pine trees and in hardwood trees, and that is that when those trees get oriented in a way that's not pointing up where they can get light, they grow a specific type of wood in reaction. So if you break over a conifer tree, it's going to grow what's called compression wood on the lower side and push itself back up to get light. It's not competitive if, if it's not fighting for light. Um, it's the opposite in hardwoods. They grow what's called tension wood on the upper portion. When those cells form, when those cells harden, it pulls the tree up. And so knowing that, you can see compression and tension wood in rings very well. Uh, I didn't bring an example of that. I should have thought about that. Uh, so and reconstruct the timing of when that started. Those, those trees, it's not uncommon to see trees of that shape in our mountains, in, snow, in places where there's a lot of snow. And as foresters, we tend to call that a uh, pistol butt. Uh, yep. what, what is it that forms that? Is, is it people out there making ship things yeah, in the mountains? Nope. Uh, it's, you know, here in the West, it's a little more slopey, which is the reason that lots of us are in the woods because that slope tends to be conducive to putting your skis or your board down when there's snow on it. That snow is heavy. And when those trees are young, it can creep and push them over. And every year it's been trying to work its way back up to fight for light. I mean, it's really common in Aspen, but you will see it in conifers as well. The steeper the slope, the more you'll see that. And it's, I call it snow creep because the snow, the weight of the snow is, is fighting against the tree. Those poor trees, it's too cold up there. <laughs> So what's the oldest tree that you have ever cored? Uh, it's not rapid fire, but I can show you a picture of the oldest cross section I've ever taken. Sure. Let's see. And how old is that? So this tree that we sampled, where did it go? That's not it. From Northern Utah died in 1936 and it lived for about 2,000 years wow. for that. Let me share my screen now. I got the picture up. So afterwards you're gonna to have to explain how you know what year it died. You weren't around in 1936. How the heck do you figure that out? Again the, the answer again is cross-dating. So I'm sorry this picture isn't better. What you're looking at is the whiteboard in my lab which is eight feet wide and then a six feet piece of Douglas fir with the buttress of a Utah juniper mounted on it. So that's about six feet of buttress. It was on the uphill side of the tree, holding the tree onto an incredibly steep slope. And the outside ring, so that the very leftmost portion there, you can see it's lobed and it's a little bit lighter in color because that's the only live part of the tree where ring width growth is happening. We determined the outside ring was 1936. Um, this thing died during the 1930s drought, which was very severe. We don't have the inside ring on this particular sample, but we got pretty close. And it was something like the year, uh, a little over 2000 years ago. So in, in calendar years, it'd be like negative 30 or something like that. So before the, the BC AD boundary. And this is the oldest known Utah juniper um, to date. And it comes from northern Utah. So thank you for one, sharing that. One of our rapid fire questions from a panelist, well, what was the weather like in the time of Christ? And I think you just uh, made reference to that, <laughs> how, how you how you figure that out. It's possible. We haven't reconstructed any climate with that particular cross section, but I, I think that we could. Is Somebody asks, have you ever gotten an increment core caught in a tree that you had to leave it there? Only once have I ever left one that I couldn't recover, and that was in a mountain mahogany. What about the opposite? Uh, have you ever gotten your core stuck inside your increment bore that you couldn't get it out? No, we have tricks for getting the, the mangled wood out of that drill bit. <laughs> Is there a best time of year to core a tree? Uh, yeah, I mean, so 
practically speaking, yes, the growing season, they're pretty pliable, uh, but you need to keep in mind what it is you're trying to do with your study and that's gonna influence, maybe you don't wanna core the tree when it's halfway through the growing season and you only get half of the ringlet. So that's another consideration to take into account. So we have a, oh, go ahead. Excuse me, a few questions about petrified wood. Is there, does that tie into dendrochronology in any way? Yes, it can. And so I, I, I don't do it myself, but I have colleagues who take cross sections of petrified wood. We can do that. And then we sand, we, it's rock working techniques, but you smooth it down and you can usually determine the species of, of wood that that used to be. Uh, you can also measure ringlets and you can cross date those trees among themselves. What we don't have is a continuous record of that date from contemporary time, two millions of years ago. In fact, in general, in the United States, I think our longest continuous tree and record goes back a little over 10,000 years using natural trees. And in Europe, they've got, I believe it's at eight or 9,000 years. And it's based on um, oak timbers out of buildings. So it's not from old, old trees, it's from old structures. Somebody asks, do trees make sounds aside from rustling leaves? All kinds of noises. They're particularly loud when they fall over, but you have to be in the woods a lot to be lucky to hear that. <laughs> um, they make an incredibly loud noise if when you're boring them, if you haven't treated your bore with wax or WD-40 and, and you catch them on a part that they're leaning. So, um, yeah, that makes a very loud squeaking noise. It can. It does not sound happy. <laughs> what is the oldest calendar year that you've documented in your dendrology lab or dendrochronology lab? Sorry. Oh, that's a good question because I can show you. I have that piece of wood right here. This is a piece of bristlecone pine. Um, here's the center. And here's the outermost ring right there. It's labeled. This zero right here is the DC, BC AD boundary. And there are 1331 rings to the inside of that. So this tree is about this piece of wood, this, this, this section right here is over 3,300 years old. This comes from near price. And, and while we measured this in my lab, this was sampled by Dr. Matt Becker at, at BYU. Bristlecone pine, it's cross-stated. We get other trees that match this, but this one is the oldest piece that we've done so far. It's from right here in Utah. So I wonder, are you going out and cutting all these down or are these, does your lab accept donations? Like can people donate cross sections to you? Uh, we rarely cut down live trees. Live trees tend not to be very old. That dead wood that's on the ground is much more useful for going back in time. This piece of wood probably stood dead for many centuries to a, to a millennia. And then when we found this, it was lying on the ground. And one reason we know that is this squaring that you can see here. This happens when a piece of wood is exposed to the elements. You know, our winds tend to come from the same direction for many hundreds of years at a time. We tend to get that squaring off of the, as it's, as it's abraded. Hey, is it possible that some trees have survived the early settlers and urbanization and, and, and still be around today? I think we're lucky that piece I just showed you is not far from uh, Price and it has never been collected for firewood, which I think would be the only use, use of that wood. Um, but we can certainly find lots of examples of living trees that have survived um, our exploitations. Even within, I'll suggest, even within a few miles of campus where we are right now. Yep. So we've got a question here that's been upvoted a couple of times. Do you use carbon dating in your lab process? So it's not something that I do in, as part of my lab. I do collaborate with people. Uh, sometimes we need to do carbon dates. The nice thing about cross dating is that when I have tree rings, I can have annual resolution and carbon dates don't allow annual resolution but maybe we want to go back farther than a few thousand years, say with um, a sediment core from a lake or from wood that we can't cross state that we think is actually older, which does exist. 
then we will take a sample of that wood and, and have it carbon dated or a sample of, of, of some sort of organic matter from the mud at the bottom of the lake and use carbon dates to determine that. But no annual precision. Can't, we can't say with annual precision what happened. One of our attendees asks, do you have any uh, books that you suggest for the layman? Yeah, I mean, if you just like the stories, uh, Dr. Valerie Truet just published a book last year called Tree Story, uh, available on Amazon. She's a dendrochronologist at the Laboratory of Tree and Research down in Tucson, Arizona. A, a really good book for stories. Uh, if you want to read how it's done, but in, you know, sort of a beginner's approach. Jim's, Dr. Jim Spear has written a book called Introduction to Dendrochronology. It was published in 2010. And uh, it's really the beginner's guide if you want to start, you know, maybe start learning how to do it. There, is also, there were some questions about um, trees communicating with one another, which we're not going to touch on today because that is a whole another thing. But there, for people who are wondering about that, there is a book called The Hidden Life of Trees. And that goes completely very very well into how trees communicate with one another through the multitude of ways that they do so. So that would be a good one as well. Um, how can you reconstruct insect outbreaks with tree rings? If you can answer that quickly. <laughs> yeah, uh, so multiple lines of evidence. So sometimes the insects actually leave a scar. I don't have one of those with me, but um, if the trees, if the insect's not successful and the tree lives, it can actually leave a scar like we saw on that Douglas fir cross section. Um, but most of the time what we do is we look at the growth of the trees adjacent to the trees that were attacked and infer that the growth, growth release was due to an insect attack. Are you seeing any impacts on, any impacts of climate on tree ring growth? Yeah, I, I mean, we didn't get into in detail about what limits tree rings. Uh, when we're doing the climate reconstructions, we choose trees specifically based on the primary limiting factor to their growth. And that will influence whether you choose a tree to reconstruct precipitation, temperature, snowfall, etc. cetera. Um, if we know that about a tree, we can then determine if changes, changing warming temperature and changing climate uh, is changing the growth variability that has been documented in, in some cases, uh, especially at northern latitudes. Is there any work tying dendrochronology and fish populations together? Probably not the best question for the end, but the answer is yes. There's a whole field of cross-dating in fish populations called scleral chronology. It was developed by Dr. Brian Black, who's, who is also at, in Arizona, at Tucson, at the Turing Lab. They use the exact same techniques of dendrochronologists, but instead of studying trees, they study, um, say, the otolith, which is the ear bone in a rockfish, which are tree species of fish that can live hundreds of years, or the shell of gooey ducks, which again is a, a marine animal. Um, they can take you know, the, the formation of calcium on their shell, which happens annually is a result of processes in nature and that they have written papers linking the production of the marine resource and its relationship to the production of tree growth on land. Both of those things are indirectly linked to climate variability in the Pacific Ocean. So um, the answer is yes. So unfortunately we have so many questions that we were not able to get to today in this hour, but maybe we'll have you back sometime. Um, people would love it if you could put the the book titles in the chat for them. Okay. I think they would enjoy that. And then I would like to ask you just a couple of very simple questions. What sure. is your favorite part of your job and what is your least favorite part of your job? Uh, oh boy. Favorite part of my job? Um, I, I mean, getting to work on trees as research, I, it's a, I guess it's a two-way street. The thing that I, that I really dislike is having so many good research ideas that I don't have time to get to. So uh, I guess that's a love-hate kind of thing. <laughs> and we would love if you could share a memorable or funny story related to dendrochronology with us. Okay. Oh, yeah. Funny, funny things don't happen in the field. A um, uh, couple summers ago, I was taking a cross-section off of a Douglas fir that was on the ground. It was the very first sample of the day. We're on a steep slope. 
and the tree was sloping down slope. And I took my brand, freshly sharpened saw and started cutting into the cross section. And, and it wasn't cutting, it wasn't cutting, it wasn't cutting. And I finally turned the saw off and, and pushed this piece of wood over. And sure enough, it was hollow in the center and a piece of siltstone had rolled into the hollow butt of the tree. And I had been with my saw, first cut of the day, I had been just trying to cut through this piece of siltstone that was inside of the tree. Um, not cool, had to go back to the rig, get a new chain, start all over. So I'm much more careful now. <laughs> Someone says rest in peace chain. That's exactly, exactly. what happened. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for everything today, Justin. We really appreciated having you with us. I think we learned a lot. It was very fascinating to say the least, definitely. You're welcome. Yes, thank you. Good job, everybody. And I will, um, I'll share this chat with everybody afterwards. And maybe if Justin had some time ever in the future and he wants to answer any of these questions, I can email them out to you guys. But thank you everybody so much for joining us. We hope that you will come back with us next month. Um, we love this series and thanks again, Justin. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Everybody have a great day.